I'm going to um, talk about something which that illustrates very well. I would like to see hands, please. And holding your hand up isn't like this. It's like this, so I can really see it. If anyone can give me, just it doesn't have to be detailed or scientific or anything like that, just give me uh, an idea of what they think homeopathy is all about. Does somebody have a, a notion? Uh, yes, sir, this gentleman right down here. Yes, sir. homeopathy is the promise that polluting something past the point of having any atoms can still have essence that would heal people. That's essentially it, yes. The gentleman said, in case you didn't hear him, that diluting a substance down uh, beyond the point where it's uh, actually present in the solution anymore can still have some efficacy, and they base it on theories of vibrations. You see, the vibrations of the original medicine are there. I'm going to give you the four rules of homeopathy, which should blow you away. I'm glad, again, that you're seated. I hate to see people fall over in hilarious laughter and damage themselves. Homeopathy started uh, over 200 years ago was started by a man named Hahnemann. Samuel Hahnemann came up with a wonderful idea. Now, 200 years ago, medicine was not then what it is today. Today, it's an art and a science. Back then, it was essentially an art. There was very little science to it. They were barely out of the age of Paracelsus, and Paracelsus, though a disagreeable chap, I never knew him, I'm not that old yet, and Paracelsus came up with this really rather smart idea. The idea was that you don't have to use natural substances, such things as, as weeds and bark and things like that, in order to heal diseases. You can use uh, simpler non-organic chemicals. And he started out by using things like uh, mercuric chloride, uh, lead acetate, uh, arsenic sulfide, a few things like that. And uh, the diseases my golly, the symptoms went away like, unfortunately, so did the patient. But they were the best looking corpses in the cemetery, I can tell you that. It usually cleared up the symptoms right away. Mercuric chloride was used for a long time, even into Victorian days. And it's a deadly poison, but it was used in very small quantities, so they didn't die right away and they could pay the bill. See? Now, this is what Paracelsus introduced to medicine. So you can imagine at that time, that people who could afford doctors had a much greater chance of dying from the disease or the treatment than people who couldn't afford doctors. And indeed, that seems to be supported by the statistics of the day. So Hahnemann came along with an idea that he would prepare medicines that wouldn't poison people like that. It was a good intention, but I want you to know the four rules of homeopathy, each increasingly more embarrassing. The first one is that you do what they call a proving. A proving in homeopathy, and I'm not going to go into all the details, that would take me three nights here. The proving consists of taking a substance, we'll call it substance X, and you give it to a patient who is well, that is to a person who is well. Now that definition isn't derived at maybe somebody who can walk and sit down and stand up again and is warm would be a person that's well, I don't know. But you give it to a person as well, and that person develops symptoms A, B, and C. Now, we'll say that the substance is uh, the, the milk from milkweed. Oh, that must taste awfully bad, the sap from milkweed. Uh, you give that to a, a well patient in a proving. And in this proving, the patient develops these three symptoms. A, uh, face gets very, very red, head swells up round like a balloon, and every 20 minutes he falls down on the ground a dead faint. Now, those are symptoms you'd be likely to notice. I think you'll agree with that. So they write that down in the book. That's called the proving. That's the first rule of homeopathy. Second rule of homeopathy is, suppose you have a patient walk into the office, and the patient sits down and says, ha, oh, am I sick? And the homeopath looks at the patient and notices that the patient has head swollen up like a balloon. It's bright red. And the homeopath says, hmm, every 20 minutes you fall down on the ground in a dead faint. And the patient looks and says, doctor, you're wonderful. Yes, I do. Wait a minute. You go through the book. And you find out what caused that in a well patient, and then you give them that medicine, and that reverses the effect. Don't look at me. It's their idea. And people down there are going, wow. And yeah. It's their idea, not mine. I'm just telling you what it's all about. Third rule of homeopathy says you don't do that. I told you they got sillier as they went along. Third rule of homeopathy says that you give them a highly diluted 
mixture of that substance. You haven't heard dilution until you hear this. I'm going to step over to the board here. This is the simple mathematical lesson, okay? 10 to the power 1 is 10. Okay, we knew that. 10 to the power 2 is 100. It's the number of zeros after the 1 that the index refers to. Okay, so 10 cubed, 10 to the third power has three zeros, and it goes on and on like that, okay? Now, in homeopathy, to prepare a solution, you take one part of the substance and you put it in 10 parts of water, and then you success it. That would be called a one solution. They never use that. Far, far too strong. Now, what they do to prepare it is they take the substance, put it in the water, and then they success it. That means shake it up and down 10 times, sideways 10 times, and back and forth 10 times in three different dimensions, 10 times each. That's called succession. I call it shaking it. <laughs> but I'm not scientific, so what do I know? That's a one solution. As I say, they never use that. Then they take one part of that solution and put it in 10 parts of water and chugga 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 the whole thing all over again. And they get a two solution, one part in 100. You follow now? Then they repeat it one more time, 10 parts, and they get one in a thousand. But that's far, far, far too concentrated. No. They prefer dilutions of one in 10 to the 20th parts of water. That's one with 20 zeros after it. That's what I call dilute. <laughs> attenuated is the term they use. Attenuated, that's really attenuated. And the fourth rule of homeopathy, as if you weren't ready for it, the more dilute the medicine is, the stronger it is. <laughs> I told you they get silly as you go along. Now, I happen to have some homeopathic medicines here on the table. No, I have homeopathic preparations. I won't dignify them by calling them uh, medicines. This one is called uh, cold and flu relief. This is a spray. Oh, it's got a rebate offer. Damn, I missed that. Mm -hmm. Breakthrough medicine. No side effects. That's true. My question is, are there any other effects? It does remove that dreadful lump in your wallet because it's very expensive. Active ingredients, folks. Listen to this now. Active ingredients. Oh. See, the, the one that's listed first is the one that's the most prevalent in the compound. Arsenicum album, in brackets it says Arsenius acid. Not to be confused with Arsenio Hall, of course. Arsenius acid. Hmm. What concentration? 30x. That means one followed by 30 zeros, parts of water, and one part of arsenicum album. I wouldn't worry about it. I wouldn't worry about it at all, friends, because that's what the 30x means. Now, wait a minute. We passed a certain point here. It's called uh, sort of the point of no return, I suppose, but the fellow named Avogadro came up with a thing called Avogadro's limit, Avogadro's number, and all. he was very awkward, but he was right. What's that? Sorry? I was just about to tell them that, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're patting your part. You're the one who runs on in flames afterwards, isn't it? Uh, yes, 10 to the 23rd. Once it, got to, it gets to a, a 23rd uh, solution there, if you can call it a solution at that point, there is only a chance of there being one molecule or atom of the original substance present in the mixture. So by the time you get to 10 to the 24th, you've got one chance in 10 of there being one molecule there. I'm going to illustrate something for you. You see, I have here also a box of another homeopathic compound. This is Calm's Forte, a sleep aid, non-habit forming, I'll bet. 100% natural, no side effects, you see. Again, they tell us this. I uh, see. Now, there are 32 capsules in here. Not too long ago, I did a, a demonstration for the U.S. Congress, a, a group of congressmen and congressional aides. And I started the lecture by going to an aide that was sitting down in the front row, and I gave him a $20 bill, and I said, I want you to run across the street to the Eckert's Pharmacy over there, big pharmaceutical chain. And I said, I want you to buy me two boxes of this, and I gave him an original box. And he came back with the two boxes. I had to open them up and pour all the pills, 32 pills and 32 pills, that makes 64, and uh, put them in the glass there, and he put them in the glass, 
And I told the congressional aides and congressmen there what this was all about, and I downed 64 of them. Took a glass of water, swallowed them down. They're in a, a base of lactic acid, which is lactose, and tastes about like packing material. I would say that sort of like the plaster or something. It's a really bad taste. And um, it says on the package, it says, uh, maximum dose, two tablets every eight hours. In case of an overdose, call your poison control center. <laughs> I'm still here, Charlie. I th took 32 tablets, and though some of the congressmen fell asleep, I didn't. I'm still here, and I do this regularly, except that lactic acid really tastes awful. It's nasty stuff. But there's nothing in these tablets. Oh, what is the active ingredient? Come on, you should be able to tell me by now. Caffeine, you got it. The sleeping pill. It works the opposite way. Don't look at me, it's their idea, not mine. This is what homeopathy is all about. But wait, it gets better. I said that the more diluted it is, the better it works, right? Ha <laughs> ha! Guess how high they go, folks? They go up to 10 to the power of 1,500. <laughs> I'm not going to start writing the zeros, I'll tell you that. Those zeros would run right out, out of the room, I'm sure. That's really powerful stuff when you get to that extent. Now, I asked my good friend Martin Gardner, formerly of Scientific American Magazine, I said, Martin, do a little math for me, would you? Uh, save me some time and I'll have it from an authority like you. I said, what is that equivalent to? And he said, well, you need sort of a metaphor. I said, yes, some sort of figure of speech because I'm talking to, to technically minded people, scientifically minded people, and the layman and reasonably intelligent folks who can grasp something if it's a little, made a little easier for them. And figures like uh, 1,500 uh, 1, dilution, such, I don't care how scientific you are, you just can't get a notion of it unless it's simplified for you, and here it is. He said that's equivalent to taking one grain of rice, that's one, one, uno, eins, one grain of rice, crushing it to a powder and dissolving it in a sphere of water the size of the solar system <laughs> with the sun at the center and the orbit of Pluto at the outside. Wait a minute. What about chuka chuka chuka? <laughs> I don't know. It's their problem, not mine. And then repeating that process two billion times. <laughs> now, if that ain't dilute, I don't know what is. But folks, sure, you can laugh at this. We all laugh at this. It's comical. It's juvenile. It's asinine. There's no other way to describe it. But these medicines are being sold in leading pharmacies today, pharmaceutical chains across the country. And just recently, just three or four days ago, they came up on the internet offering people who are worried about terrorist attacks homeopathic medicine that they say are antidotes for radiation poisoning, bubonic plague, smallpox, and anthrax. Now, if this isn't taking advantage of people's grief and their need for some sort of relief, I don't know how else you can determine it. I mean, you can't label it any other way. These are swindlers, liars, cheats, frauds, fakes, criminals. Come on, sue me. No, they won't sue me. They know damn well their case won't stand up in a court of law. It doesn't stand up in science at all. It falls apart. And they say, but we've got these affidavits. Yeah, Nixon said he didn't know about Watergate, too, and he was the president of the United States, remember? Now, am I understandably angry about this thing? Have I got a good cause to be angry? 